Christine, would you read it with me? And we all read together, all together. Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your flocks and herds. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. God gave us tithing to teach us to put God first. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing today in this series. We owe it to you. And today we want to speak on the subject, Make Your Money Matter. Look at your neighbor and say, Make It Matter. Make it matter. There are a few things that compete for dominance in our lives like money. My friend, my brother, my baby brother, Dr. Howard John Wesley, who leads the Alfred Street Church in Alexandria, Virginia, reminded us all of this reality in a brilliant message that he did recently on the subject of finance and generosity. He recalled for us 1973 in his introduction when an incredible soul and funk trio out of Philadelphia took the nation by storm by recording a song that was iconic in its time and is still legendary today. And for those of you who are musically astute and aware, you remember that this song had a funky bass line that propelled it to number nine on the Billboard charts and number three on the R&B charts. <laughs> Who and what occupies first place 
in your life because giving is essentially a spiritual decision and not just a financial one. And so today the target of this small talk is not dollars and cents, but confident, intelligent, authentic trust in God. Trust that is based on the promise, provision, and protection of God. Trust based on God's track record in history and in our lives because ultimately the tithe is all about trust. Everybody say trust. That's why God instructed the people of Israel speaking through the prophet Malachi to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. God says that as we discipline our lives to give in faith, God is able to pour out such a blessing in our lives that we won't be able to take it in. The target of the tithe is discipline. Everybody say discipline. <laughs> the target of the offering is sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. And the target of the alms, which is money we give to bless and help the poor, is compassion. Everybody say compassion. compassion. That through the tithe, God is teaching us discipline. Through the offering, God is teaching us sacrifice. And through the alms, God is teaching us compassion. The tithe is not the top, it's the bottom. It's not the conclusion, it's the commencement of a generous lifestyle. God wants to use the resources that God makes available to us to instill critical values within us that will enhance and enrich the entire experience of life for us. God wants to bless you, but in order for God's blessing to flow uninterrupted to you, God has to be able to send his blessing through you. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus talks about the issue. Jesus says, give, and it shall be given to you, running over, multiplied, for with the same measure you give it out, you will receive it. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Repeatedly, Old Testament and New, Scripture states that as we give a portion, not all, but a portion of our earnings to God and the work of God, God promises to return a blessing in our lives. Not a little blessing, not a trite blessing, not a no free blessing but a significant running over multiplied blessing and God wants to know from each of us on an individual and collective level do you believe me do you believe my promise will you test me in this will you practice the discipline of putting me first not just in your talk and in your time and in your talent but also with your treasure will you permit me to prove myself faithful to you because across the centuries and believe it or not in this church there are countless persons who have taken God at his word and have given God money and minutes and their testimony today is that God is faithful that while they may not have everything they want God has always supplied everything that they need in Philippians 4, 8, Paul rejoiced that he was amply supplied because God always keeps his promise. God has always poured out a blessing. God has always shown up, shown off, and shown out. And so ultimately our giving is not about our finances. It's about who and what we trust. So let me ask the question, what happens as we tithe? Can I talk about it real quick? Because because first of all, when we give our tithe, it deepens our discipline. Everybody shout, discipline. <laughs> See, God wants us to prosper, but it's going to require our participation. In Proverbs 11.25, the text says, Blessed are those who are generous 
they prosper and are satisfied. God wants us to prosper, but it's going to require our participation. In Psalm 5, verse 12, it says, you bless the righteous and you surround them with favor. God gives favor, but the question is, do you have the discipline to keep you where favor is going to take you? You don't want to hear this. See, and discipline is at least three things. Number one, it's initially painful. Number two, it's reliably progressive. And number three, it's ultimately profitable. Giving our tithe deepens our discipline because it requires us to prioritize, dedicate, and consecrate a portion of our money and our minutes for the God that we profess to love. That takes discipline and I recognize immediately how challenging this is because we live in a culture and in a historical moment that is incredibly undisciplined. Did anybody see that three-pointer that LeBron James hit at the buzzer to put Cleveland ahead 3-2 in the series against Indiana? He didn't just do that on the spur of a moment. That was a reflection of his discipline. I'm reminded of this little boy who was in the first grade. The bus showed up in front of his house and his mother sent him out ready to begin her day when 30 seconds later the doorbell rang. She opened in the front door. The little boy is standing there with his lunchbox in his hand. She said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be on that bus on your way to school. He said, Mama, I quit. <laughs> she said, you quit? Why do you want to quit school? He said, I was thinking about it, and so without hesitation, he said, it's too long, it's too hard, and it's too boring. His mama said, baby, you just described the rest of your life. Now get your butt on that bus. <laughs> See, I'm going to help somebody today because God wants us to prosper, but it's going to require us to get on the bus. Tap your neighbor say, get on the bus. <laughs> See, it's not so much a matter of what God is going to do for you as it is a matter of what God wants to do through you, with you, and because of you. Discipline is progressively learning how to manage what we already have while we work for what we want. Are you listening to me? Proverbs 21.20 says, The wise person saves for the future, but the fool spends whatever they get. Can I give you something to pray about as you leave the day? You ought to pray about living on a budget. Smile at somebody say, it feel like he cussing at you, don't it? <laughs> See, you ought to ask God to help you create a budget and live by it so that you can give 10%, you can save 10%, and you can live on the 80. Would you pray about that? I know some of you don't want to, but can I get you to pray for your neighbor if you're not a on a budget, amen. Help them live on a budget. See, because a budget is a blessing. A budget is telling your money where you want it to go rather than just wondering where your money went. See, and that's challenging because our entire culture is designed to keep you spending, to keep you broke, and to keep you in debt. Preach, Pastor. But when your output exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. Y'all ought to write that down and tweak that. Tithing this deepens our discipline. Joy does not come from what you get. Joy comes from learning to be content with what you are already have, that you may not be rolling in what you want to roll in, but if you roll it, you ought to still give God praise. See, giving our tithe deepens our discipline, but it also declares our devotion. Everybody say devotion. The tithe is literally in the scripture, the first 10% of what we earn, and the scriptures instruct us that we are to give that to God. Somebody shout that. 
in Genesis 14, 17. And this is before the law of Moses. This is before the Levitical law. This is before the Ten Commandments. This is before the New Testament. Abraham gave 10% of his increase as a concrete expression of devotion and thanksgiving. In Genesis 28, 22, Jacob said to God, of all that you give me, I will give a tenth. And throughout the scriptures, we are taught that as people of faith, we are to take the first 10% of everything we receive and give it to God. Our trust, our hope, our confidence are not ultimately in companies or cars or cash or contributions or, uh, or even corporations, but in God. When the people of Israel settled in the land, their primary means of income was agriculture. The sale of crops and the sale of her herds. So in Leviticus 27.30, they were reminded a tithe of everything you have belongs to the Lord. Because giving my tithe declares my devotion because the tithe, listen to this, is a tangible symbol of worship. Some might say tangible. Show me your calendar and your checkbook and I'll tell you what's really important in your life. If you want to know what's in your heart, all you got to do is follow what's in your hand. I'm reminded of this wealthy old man who had just married this pretty woman who was 40 years younger than he. Of course, he wondered in the back of his mind whether this young girl married him for his money. So one day, he summoned his courage and he asked her, he said, Baby, if I lost all my money, would you still love me? She said, Don't be silly, boo. Of course I love you and I miss you terribly. <laughs> Yeah, y'all get that on the way home. Amen. See, see, I believe that within the heart of every person of faith, there is a sincere desire to worship God for who God is. Have I got any witnesses? God smiles as we tie minutes in worship and praise. God smiles as we tie minutes in prayer and proclamation. God smiles when, as the people of God, we magnify God with our mouth. And in the same way, God has instructed us through the scriptures that every week we are to worship God in a tangible way with our money. We are not just to shout our thanks, but we are to show our thanks by our giving. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, on the first day of the week, tap your neighbor, say, that's Sunday, amen. He said, on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with their income for freely you have received let us freely give the tithe declares our devotion because it's a tangible symbol of worship but also it's a positive display of obedience Maya Angelou that poet laureate once wrote that giving liberates the soul of the giver in Genesis 4 Cain obeyed God he just did it with a bad attitude. He gave the proper amount, but he gave it in the wrong spirit. In Luke 11, 42, Jesus condemns the Pharisees not for their tithing. They were regular and consistent tithers, but because their motive was misguided. Listen to his correction. He says in that text, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth, but you neglect justice and the love of God and the love of others. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. See, positive obedience requires not only that we do what God asks us to do, but that we put our heart in what we are doing. Back in the day, and I'm going to date myself with this, Atlantic Star used to sing a song that said, if your heart isn't in it, why can't you tell me so? Okay, y'all know that song, you're too young. But it reminds me of the, one of my favorite stories that the roof of this little church was falling down and the members not able to afford to repair it began to do what they could do and that was to hold regular prayer meetings to pray for 
funds to be able to fix it. And there was an old man in the church who was wealthy enough. He was doing really well financially, but he was known to be real tight and stingy with his money. He had a rubber band around his wallet. And somebody knows what that means, that nothing accidentally gets out. See, and at every prayer meeting, he would sit in the back of the church so that he could sneak out just before the offering. And one time he was sitting there in the back of the church when one of the old mothers of the church was up front praying with all of her heart, calling on the Lord. And as she was praying, sure enough, a piece of that move fell and hit him on the head. Bad thing, but feeling like God had spoken to him, he stood up in the back and said, all right, Lord, I'll give a thousand dollars. And the old mother who was praying said, hit him again, Lord, hit him again. <laughs> Don't make God have to hit you upside your head in order to get you to give. See, giving should flow from your heart because love never empties the heart and giving never empties the hand. That's what David knew in Psalm 116, 12 when he asked, what shall I render unto God for all of his benefits towards me? In 2 Corinthians 8, 5, Paul praised the believers in Macedonia saying, and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. Their obedience sprang from a devoted heart, but also as we give the tithe, it's a genuine act of trust. As I give my tithe, it's a definitive declaration that I trust in God. And because I trust in God, I know and I believe and I affirm that God will do exactly what he said he would do. Can I go back for a moment to Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse? We had a tithe, money and minutes. Everybody say money and minutes. Amen. It's not either or, it's and both. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the place, into the fellowship where I believe God has called me to participate. I'm to give my tithe. Why? The verse says that there may be meat. That's the King James Version that there may be food, that's the NIV, that there may be ample provision, that's the message, in my house. It's a declaration of my devotion. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, just as you excel in everything, see also that you excel in the grace of giving. Because giving declares our devotion. But can I go a little further? It also defines our distribution. What happens when we give God our tithe? It's right there in that text in Malachi. God responds and says, I will open. Look at your neighbor saying, not you, but God. God says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's the King James. But the message translation, more contemporary, I like how the message puts it. In that verse, it says, I will pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. God says, if you can trust me when you cannot trace me, I'm going to demonstrate my power in your life. God says, if you focus on what I told you to do, then I'll focus on what you asked me to do. The blessing of God comes to the people of God as we function in faithfulness to God. It defines our distribution. It places us in a posture to receive from God. And Deuteronomy 28 says it unabashedly. It says, you will not just have enough. You will have more than enough. Listen to the word. You'll be blessed in the city and you'll be blessed in the country you'll be blessed coming in and you'll be blessed going out wait your children will be blessed you missed it they don't even have to give if you give they'll be blessed your enemies will be defeated they'll come at you one way but run from you in seven ways and God will order, y'all should listen close, a blessing on your workplace. 
This is all in Deuteronomy 28. He says, you will lend to many, but never need a loan from any. Oh, I love the word. You will always be the head and not the tail, always the top dog and never the bottom puppy. All these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you because you have responded to the Lord. God says, test me in this and see if I won't honor my word. See if I won't blow your mind. See if I won't fight your battle. See if I won't flip your script. See if I won't keep my promise. See if I won't heal your body. See if I won't provide your need. And so the question is, are you proving God to be faithful? Are you faithfully giving your time of money and minutes? Or do you lack trust in God? Can I push it further? How can you trust God to save your soul and not trust God to be your source? How can you trust God to answer your prayers and guide your decisions and take care of your kids and open your door and heal your body and watch over your life and lift up your head and make your enemies leave you alone and yet you cannot trust God to honor your time. My heart aches and breaks for believers who don't trust God enough to tithe because God is so able. God is so powerful. It is such an adventure to trust God and wait and see how God is going to work that thing out. I feel sorry for people who are only doing math when they could be enjoying miracles. As we tithe, it deepens our discipline. It declares our devotion. It defines our distribution. And in that same text, it details our defense. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got help. No, now this time, tell them like you mean it. That was the wrong neighbor. Talk to the other one and say, I ain't all by myself. I got to help. Amen. In verse 17 of chapter 3 of Malachi's prophecy, God says, I will, listen, not you, but I will, not you, but I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's King James. In the message it says, God says, I will defend you. Y'all don't know when to shout. Wait. God says, as you trust me, Lance Watson translation, I won't let anything or anybody destroy you or your stuff. Can I shout right there? He says, I will restrain the power of the enemy to touch you. Do you know what the enemy would like to do to you, to your family, to your business, to your church? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes and he has a threefold agenda to steal and if he can't do that, to kill and if he can't do that, to destroy. But God says if you trust me and you act on my word, I will restrain the attacks of the enemy. He might be a pit bull, but he on my leash. God says I will glorify myself through you. I guarantee your protection. I guarantee your victory. I will make you into a delightful land. I will turn you into a walking witness. I will make you into a talking testimony. I will make you exhibit number one for my power, my favor, my grace, and my glory. I'll push back your enemy. I'll be the banner flying over your life. I will command your blessing. I will say yes he will he says I'll walk you through your Red Sea I'll knock down the wall standing in front of you I will overcome your giants because I am your defense and when you know and you admit that God is your defense then you know that God alone is worthy to be praised your trust can't ultimately
ultimately, friends, be in plans or purposes or in your intelligence, your ingenuity, or your capacity. You've got to put your trust in God alone because your money can be lost, your credit can be wrecked, your identity can be stolen, your house can be foreclosed, your car can be repo, but there's one person that nobody can touch, and that's God alone. And somebody here ought to grab that promise right now. God is my defense. God is my king. God is my creator. God makes my way. God opens my doors. God creates my opportunity. That's why you beat the odds. That's why you broke through the ceiling. That's why the pressure didn't break you. That's why the foreclosure didn't kill you. That's why the sickness couldn't take you out. That's how you made it through. That's how you made it over. Because God was your defense. That's why you exceeded expectations. The more they put on you, the better you were. Every time they set a trap, you still survive. Every time they put you down, you rose higher because God is your defense. And that's a word for somebody here because God is defending you right now against sickness, against disease, against demons, against death, against depression, against despair, against desperation, against anxiety. It's not that you cute, but it's the Lord on your side. If it had not been, you ought to tap somebody and say, it doesn't matter who's against me. If God is for me, it doesn't matter what I don't have. If God is defending me, it doesn't matter what I lack when the Lord is fighting my battles because whatever I need, He can provide. Would you testify right now? Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, I know He'll make a way. 